Our story is by now familiar enough that you know what we're going to do. We start with Equilibria, and then we move on from there. So let's get going in the context of the Lorentz system. Remember that system, we have x, y, and z, and their derivatives with respect to time are, respectively, minus sigma x plus sigma y, r times x minus y minus xz, and xy minus bz. Now what we need to do is set all three of these equal to zero and then solve. Starting with the first equation, we set negative sigma x plus sigma y equal to zero, cancel out the sigma, we get that x equals y. Simple. Now, substitute that into the second equation, set it equal to zero, I'm going to say y equals x, and then factor out an x, I get x times quantity r minus 1 minus z equal to 0. This gives us two possibilities. Either x is equal to 0, or z is equal to r minus 1. With the third equation, x, y minus b, z equals 0, we can again substitute in y equals x, and we can solve for x as being plus or minus square root of b times z. Putting all this together gives us two possibilities. The first is that x equals zero, and so does y and so does z. So the origin is an equilibrium. The second possibility, a little bit more interesting, is when z equals r minus one, and in that case, we can use the third equation to solve for x and for y, given by plus or minus square root of b times quantity r minus 1. Now remember, since b is positive, we need, in order for this pair of equilibria to exist, r must be greater than or equal to 1. And when r is equal to 1, we have the origin. Aha, that looks interesting. But let's go slowly and carefully, beginning with the origin. If we take the right-hand side of the Lorentz system, call that f, then the derivative of f evaluated at the origin is, well, this is easy. We can just read it right off from this polynomial. So going by rows, the first row is minus sigma plus sigma zero. The second row is r negative one zero. And the third row is zero zero minus b. This is really nice because it's got a block diagonal structure. So we can see, for example, in that lower right-hand corner, that negative b, that eigenvalue, negative b, corresponds to an eigenvector that is along the z-axis. That means that the origin has this direction of stability along the z-axis. Now the other two eigenvectors are going to lie in the xy plane. Let's investigate that two by two block. This is gonna be really simple. What's the trace of this block? It is minus sigma minus one, that's negative. What is the determinant of this two by two block? It's sigma minus r times sigma. So that's sigma times quantity one minus r. And again, we see that one minus r show up. Aha. It's now clear that we have two cases to deal with. The first is when r is sufficiently small between zero and one. This system has one equilibrium at the origin and it's a sink because that trace is negative, determinant is positive, you could check that there are no complex eigenvalues there. But the second case, a little bit more interesting, when r is bigger than one, we have three equilibria. And the origin winds up being a saddle with two dimensions of stability and one dimension of instability. And in addition to the origin, there's a pair of additional equilibria located at plus or minus root b times r minus one, plus or minus root b times r minus one, and r minus one. And guess what? That direction of instability, that unstable manifold 
that leads right into that pair of equilibria. This is, of course, a bifurcation. It's, of course, a pitchfork bifurcation. It is, of course, a supercritical pitchfork bifurcation happening at the origin when r is equal to 1. Okay, that's the origin. But what happens with this pair of equilibria? Let's say that r is bigger than 1, but still close to it. In that case, it's kind of clear what's going on. We have our origin with our two dimensions of stability, and then that one weaker dimension of instability that goes out and leads into a pair of equilibria. But look, we still have those two other directions of stability. That has not changed under this bifurcation. That means that for values of r that are close to, but a little bit bigger than 1, what we have is a pair of sinks. That is, of course, consistent with what we would be seeing in a supercritical pitchfork. And that's great. But what does that mean for larger values of r? Are there any additional changes or bifurcations at these points? Well, you know what to do. Let's linearize. Let's take the derivative of the right-hand side, which we have previously played around with. This is not so hard to work with. And if we evaluate this at the point where x and y are equal to plus or minus square root of b times quantity r minus 1, and z equals r minus 1, then what do we get? Our derivative is as follows. The first column is minus sigma 1 plus or minus square root of b times quantity r minus 1. The second column is sigma minus 1 plus or minus square root of b times quantity r minus 1. The third column is 0 minus or plus square root of b times quantity r minus 1. And lastly, minus b. Now this might be a little unpleasant to work with because this is not a block diagonal matrix. We're actually going to have to compute the eigenvalues. So I'm taking a look at this and I'm seeing that first row, which is fairly simple looking. It's got a zero in it. I think that is going to be a good candidate for doing minor expansion. So what I want you to do is take this matrix, subtract off lambda times the identity, do that minor expansion, do some simplification to get the characteristic polynomial. This is going to take a little bit of work, and I'm going to let you do that. And we're back. I hope you had fun doing that. What's the characteristic polynomial? I hope that you got what I got, which is lambda cubed plus quantity 1 plus b plus sigma times lambda squared plus b times quantity r plus sigma times lambda plus 2 sigma b times quantity r minus 1. Set all of that equal to 0. That's it. Now all we have to do is solve that. Oh, hmm. That might not be so easy. What are we going to do?